I won't criticise you if you forget. And oh, by do, if, to do that, if you again, you just hover your mouse over the um, box, you'll see the microphone, and you just click on that. Uh, I'll do that. So, right so we're live, uh, Tony. You're assuming I'll remember to turn it back on again. <laughs> I've worked with professionals like Peter Hadfield, who's forgotten to do such things. Uh, and can I obviously thank you, but I'll obviously be thanking you at the end, but um, I think that it's, it's good spirited of you both to agree to do this. Well, it's a, it's a wonderful cause and I admire you for having spent so much time on this marathon to try to raise money for it. Good for you. Thank you very and, much. And uh, I'd like to make some comments about Medicine and Soft Frontier at the end of it, uh, Richard, and encourage people to uh, contribute. Is, is that okay? Uh, it's absolutely fantastic, yes. Um, but we are live now. I think people can actually hear us. Um, as okay. As I've got a uh, thumbs up. Uh, I just need to close that down. Yeah, can people hear us? Yeah, I'm getting a thumbs up. Well, I hope that you've been enjoying the show so far. We're now halfway through the 24 hours, uh, and it seems an awful long time ago that I started at the... Uh, laboratories of the uh, Nottingham University Physics Department. Um, it seems days ago, in a kind of way it is, it, well, half a day. But we've got another 12 hours to go, and it is a huge pleasure to welcome two of my favorite people on the internet. So I say that only because I've never met you in person. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start with Eugenie Scott, and I, I know that I'm going to embarrass her, but she re recently received an award from the Atheist Alliance uh, um, International, uh, which was given to her by video message by none other than uh, Richard Dawkins, who, if you were not around, was actually on the show um, eight hours ago. Um, and don't worry, all of these are being recorded and they will ultimately uh, be posted on YouTube. Richard Dawkins said of Eugenie Scott, Eugenie Scott is one of my very favorite people. It is impossible to meet Eugenie without loving her. And I was made very welcome when I visited uh, their NCSE um, offices. Uh, she is too intelligent and well informed to be religious, a great science educator, a gallant fighter for the cause of science and reason, a brilliant woman, universally admired road mole at the height of her very considerable powers. Jeannie is Jeannie, she's Got a bit intimate there. Jeannie is a true That's scholar, uh, deeply read, not just in the scientific literature, but also in the bizarre counterculture, anti-culture of creationism. I have to say, Eugene, I know that would make you blush, but <laughs> praise from Caesar is praise indeed. <laughs> oh, indeed, indeed. And, and uh, not, not being, being praised for being a scholar, uh, by somebody like Richard Dawkins is uh, is embarrassing because I'm nowhere near that. I, uh, you know, many many years ago, I, I I left an academic environment to be in this sort of peculiar world of of uh, science communication, public understanding of science, running this odd little nonprofit out in California called the National Center for Science Education, and I I, I think I. I could claim to be doing scholarly work to some degree, um, but I'm I'm not a research scientist anymore. That's for sure. But it it was it was lovely to have those nice things said about me by Richard, uh, who is somebody I admire very much. Now the backhand slap, right? He did say <laughs> he did say that there were differences between you. Um, Certainly. What what are those? Because I I think it from what I understood, he was saying that he thought you were just too soft on religion and you should be more strident perhaps yeah basically that's uh, that's an area that we just uh, disagree with um, my background is in anthropology I mean I'm a physical anthropologist which is the the biological aspect of anthropology but um, I'm more broadly trained in my undergraduate and graduate degrees also I mean we had to understand cultural anthropology archaeology 
keep your expectations low on linguistics, but you know the the four fields of of anthropology: physical, linguistics, archaeology, and cultural. And I, I really I really have a very different perspective on evolution. Excuse me, I have a different perspective on religion than a lot of other non-believers because of my anthropological background. And I mean, the the, the fact of the matter is that. Every human society ever studied has had some kind of concept of a what I've called a non-material reality. Uh, religion takes many, many, many forms, um, from ancestor spirits to uh, worshiping or uh, recognizing um, animate characters and inanimate objects like trees and rocks and, and mountains and so forth to creation of uh, gods and um, uh, a god and so forth and so on. So, so th this non-material reality that all human societies seem to uh, find very easy to learn is, is really a human universal and I mean it's obvious that it has adaptive value and you have to you you have to recognize that that even though I'm not a believer and and many of my friends are not believers, um, there's something extremely important to human cultures about religion, and it 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 cannot be easily dismissed. Um, and of course, in my work with the National Center for Science Education, uh, which deals in part with the creationism and evolution controversy, I've had to deal with religion uh, to a degree that I think a lot of other scientists have, have really not had to deal with. And, and you know, I, I have a great respect for many of the practitioners of religion that I've come across who are very sophisticated people. The fact that religion doesn't speak to me doesn't mean I can't appreciate the fact that it does speak to most other human beings. The, the difference of opinion that Richard and I have about uh, religion uh, is, is a philosophical one. Uh, I'm not anti-religious. Um, you know, as, as an anthropologist, it makes about as much sense to be anti-religious as it would be to be anti-kinship, you know, <laughs> because it's, it's just part of the human condition. But Richard and I share a very important goal, and that is to help people understand evolution, to help people understand science, hopefully to accept that evolution took place, hopefully to understand what a, a life-enriching thing a science can be. Um, he has an additional goal, which is to try to increase the number of non-believers in the world. Um, I don't share that goal. And I think. Can I just pick um, you up on, on that issue? Because sure. um, I, I've often asked myself, you know, what what is my problem with religion? Um, is it a bad thing? And does it, you know, give comfort and uh, so, so on to some people? And should I be critical of them for taking comfort in something that I don't believe? But there was an expression that you used. You actually said um, it has adaptive value. And I didn't understand that point. Could you expand on that? When you, um, I mean, there's, hello, I still, can you hear me? Perfectly, yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, my, uh, it, it sounded different to me and I wasn't sure if I was still speaking. Um, you don't find something that is a human cultural universal, something found in every single human culture unless it has adaptive value. Uh, and in fact, uh, sociologists and anthropologists have looked at the role of religion in human societies and this role varies hugely so there's not one single answer to this, this issue of, of the adaptiveness of religion. But it's clear that there are many ways that religion can um, uh, increase the probability of a particular group um, passing on its genes and its memes, if you will, to use a, a really wonderful idea of Richard's. Um, minimally, I mean, you know, we could spend a whole hour on this, but minimally, religion increases the us-them aspect of a society. It tends to um, increase the awareness of people for others within their tribe or their society or their culture. And this, this can definitely have adaptive value. I am acutely aware that we're 12 minutes into the show and I haven't even introduced our <laughs> second um, panelist, so to speak. 
it's a huge pleasure to welcome, I have to say, and I know that I'm going to get criticized for this, my favorite YouTuber. Um, oh. When I when I go to my subscription box and I see that there's a video from Pothole, I'm more excited than I am from anyone else. And I'm sorry, I know I'll probably get grief for that, but Pothole, huge pleasure to have you on the show. Did you want to comment on anything that you, Eugenie just said? Um, yeah, it, I mean, look, I, I've always said, and to a certain extent I agree with her, I, I have nothing against personal belief. <clears throat> as long as it's personal, and as long as it's recognized as a belief. If someone wants to believe that there's a spirit inside the teapot, that's absolutely fine with me if he wants to believe that. But it has to remain personal. He can't start telling his kids, you have to believe this too, or you're going to hell. And the other thing is he has to recognize that this is a belief. There's no scientific um, you know, evidence for it. And therefore, this isn't something he would try and push in science class that kids have to be taught. There's a possibility mm -hmm. that there's some spirit living inside the teapot. The other thing is, I, I, I'm sure you're absolutely right, because everything that the human race has, uh, obviously, if we've advanced with it, has come through some evolutionary development. But that could also be said of aggression. Aggression is something mm -hmm. that has... Um, developed in humans has been absolutely essential for human survival because when you do get tribal conflicts um, the aggressive more aggressive tribe is more likely to survive for example but does that mean in, in this sophisticated world that we we have to keep these kinds of uh, things going recognize them recognize the value in them uh, when we live in a society where perhaps they are more detrimental than beneficial. And religion to me is one of those things. As I say, I've got no, no problem with personal belief, but I find that religion is one of those uh, things that's been a hangover, a carry-on from our evolutionary years, which is now rather detrimental to society. So that, that's the problem I have with it. I think it's very important that people not confuse that something can be adaptive with, it, with the idea that it is therefore good. Uh, and so we're certainly on the same page there. Mm. My feeling, my, my consideration is that if you say religion, capital A, capital R religion, all religion is bad, it seems to me you're kind of missing the point. There's just so much variation out there in what people practice um, and what people believe. Uh, some beliefs, like the spirit in the teapot, are, are pretty benign. Other beliefs, like um, anybody who doesn't agree with me should be beheaded, that's a pretty toxic idea, okay? Mm. My consideration is, I mean, the, the way I look at it is that beware of ideology, so to speak. Uh, ideologies are not necessarily good or bad. They can be good and they can be bad. My feeling is we should be opposing crazy ideologies that hurt people, and I'd extend that to the planet as well. Some of those ideologies are religious. Not all religious ideologies are crazy ideas that hurt people. Some non-religious ideologies are crazy ideo ideologies that hurt people. I mean, I, I've joked with some friends of mine that, uh, sorry to use a, a USA-specific example, but if the Ways and Means Committee of the U.S. Uh, uh, Congress were deciding a welfare bill, I would much prefer to have a Quaker as head of that committee than a Libertarian. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I'm much more interested. Uh, in, I, I'm more interested yeah. in what people do than what they think. Yes, yeah, and there's no doubt that belief has been beneficial to prisoners who, you know, who've had, had a difficult life, a bad life, and then converted in prison and as people. What would say, well, that's because they, they have a belief. It doesn't matter whether the belief is true, but as long as they've got that belief, then, then that's okay. I think I never had religion per se in any business. Where I come in is where they get onto my turf and your turf, which is science, and they start uh, trying to argue their religion through scientific evidence. And I, I don't go after anybody in my videos if they just don't want to profess a belief in something. Um, but once they start saying, and my belief is backed up by the fact that carbon dating says it is, this, or this is a load of nonsense. Once they on, get onto the scientific turf, uh, that's where I take them head on. So I, I think at least you and I agree, and, and, and Dawkins is very yeah. good on this. We have to protect science at all costs against this kind of uh, onslaught of, of belief without substance. I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to make a big issue about your disagreements with Dawkins, but uh, how do you respond to his often uh, spoken comment that uh, what is important to him is what is true. 
it's more important. That's fine. That's his view. Um, I'm not criticizing his view. Uh, it's it's certainly a respectable and defendable view. As I say, I'm more important in. I, I, <laughs> Maybe I'm a believer in good works. I'm much more concerned with what people do than what they think. Uh, if you want to meet me down at the food truck at the um, uh, food bank and load uh, food onto the truck to take to the homeless, um, I don't care what religion you are. And I'm probably not going to stand there and debate uh, your beliefs. I just want to get the food on the truck. I, I think I'm going to have to insist that we move on. There are a number of things I need to say. Firstly, uh, we are obviously here to raise money for charity. Um, could I invite everyone to consider clicking on one of the active links in the banner above the video box? Um, and don't worry, uh, if you click on it, it will open in a separate window. You will not lose uh, your place in the room, nor will you miss any of the show. Um, Secondly, there are a number of eBay items. Uh, one of the clicks is to the eBay auction. I know that there are a number of items that are coming to an end very shortly. Uh, there are two uh, pieces of art in the book. I, I unfortunately scribbled them down so quickly I didn't get the details. Uh, and also the uh, sharp-eyed and attentive ones of you would have realized that this hour was advertised as a game of Would I Lie to You? <laughs> and I think that people in the United Kingdom are probably aware of it. Uh, people in Australia, I know that it's started being shown there, but um, I'm sorry, in, in Australia. Uh, in America, I'm not sure that it is. So I'm going to try and explain it as shortly as I can. The situation is that both um, Potholer and Eugenie will be given statements uh, to read out. Some of them are true because they have provided them, and I'm assuming they're true. Uh, some of them are false. They will not know which statement they're about to read. I'm going to be putting it into the uh, Skype uh, chat that we're having at the moment. It is then going to be the job of the opposing person, and Peter's going to go first uh, on this occasion, for Eugenie to sort of cross-examine him. I will also be taking questions from the audience, and I will also be setting up a poll. Depending on how many rooms we have, I will go uh, from room to room. If we've only got one room, obviously, I don't need to. But I'll be setting up a poll. So after a few minutes of cross-examination, um, we'll take the poll. And the idea is, it's a bit difficult to say, you, you've got to try and lie. Uh, so if, you, <laughs> if you're given one of your true statements, you've got to pretend that it isn't true and sort of like confuse the audience. But if it's one of the, a, an untrue statement, then you've obviously got to be thinking quick on your feet. Or they have, I don't. Um, quick on your feet, and we will find out whether Eugenie Scott or uh, Potholer54 is um, the best liar. We'll take it from that. And of course, we so, haven't seen the lies. Uh, that's important. Oh, yeah. We haven't seen these lies before, so they jump at us. We've got to start thinking on our feet. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to start. And it, uh, I'm going to start with Potholer. Um, I was going to roll a dice, but um, I've decided I can't be bothered with that because you're not going to see what the dice says, and I can't hold it up and say, yeah, it's number six, because <laughs> then you'll see what it's true or not. But I'm going to start with Potholer, and Potholer's first statement, which we have to judge the truth of, is uh, this. And as I write it, as I say, he has no idea whether it's one of his true statements that he has given me or whether it is something that has been made up. Okay, and I'm pressing send now. And I'll open up a poll to see if we think, or the audience thinks, that uh, Potholer is lying. I'm not seeing anything yet, Richard. How long does it normally take to come? Oh, hang on. Well, Should be help, help if I s oh, scroll down. Th this is not a uh, secret, I take it. We could actually read this out. I well, Potholer's got to read it out. Yes, that's his first I've got to read it out. Um, with a straight face, whatever it is. Uh, oh, I think I see it. Yeah, it's the one right at the bottom here. Yeah. Um, I was an extra in the film Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay, what scene? It was uh, a scene where they, it was a crowd scene. And um, it was uh, basically where the crowd was um, uh, behind, um, uh, I can't remember, it was a long time ago. It was some guy who was 
um, cracking a whip, and because uh, we didn't get to meet any of the main actors, but we we were told we had to stand in a certain place and. In the distance, it must have been about 100, 200 yards away, the, um, the cameras were rolling and there was a guy cracking a whip and then someone running away. And we had to sort of look in astonishment and, and cheer. And, uh, and that was the were, end of were the scene. You, were you in costume? What kind no, of costume we, were you wearing? Oh, yeah, they, 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 yes, it wasn't an elaborate costume. They gave us just, um, they, the, the wardrobe department um, put, gave us the costumes to wear, but there was nothing very costumey so about it. Just an ordinary what, shirt. Yeah. But Sorry. by an ordinary shirt, you mean a shirt like you would just wear to work or something like that? Or? It, was, it was a tan-colored canvas shirt. Actually, we got to keep them at the end of it, which is rather nice, and I think I've still got my wardrobe. But it was a, it was a khaki-colored shirt, and they were like baggy trousers, um, rather rough trousers. I didn't bother keeping the trousers because they were not particularly the kind of trousers I would have worn, but we were supposed to be just an ordinary crown of rather... Uh, not impoverished people, but rather ordinary people. So um, uh, they just wanted us to stand there. And when the whip cracked and the guy ran away, we had to, to cheer. And we were paid for it, too. Was this on location? Yes, it was. Well, it was on location, but uh, I think the scene was supposed to be um, in the jungle somewhere, but they didn't actually have it uh, in, in the jungle. I was, uh, I was actually in Trinidad at the time. And uh, they, it was in a park where they were doing this. Um, I don't know how integral uh, this was to the, um, the entire storyline. I mean, I didn't actually see it until years afterwards. Um, but uh, it was in a park. That's, that's where they decided was the best location to shoot it. I'm curious. Was this sort of like a part-time thing you did when you were working somewhere? Or was this a full-time job that no, you were doing? No, I was... I was on my way, I was going to South America and I stopped off in um, Port of Spain in Trinidad to see a friend of mine and they had an advertisement up at, um, I think it was at the local club because they wanted, I hate to say it, but they wanted, you know, uh, ca Caucasian people uh, to take part in this because we <laughs> were supposed to be, um, you know, that was the particular scene. And I, I didn't know anything about it. I mean, I'd been out of the UK for a while, so I didn't know anything about series and, and, uh, and so on. I didn't know about anything about the film. So um, it just said, you know, if you want to be an extra in this film, come along. So my friend, I, I, the friend who was living in Port of Spain at the time, he and I went along. And um, I think we got paid something like $50 for it or something like that, uh, which at the time was quite a bit of money. So when was this? What year? Oh, God, this is going back this is in the 1980s sometime. I can't remember the year, to be honest, Eugenie. Uh, late you, 70s, you, don't remember, you don't remember when you were in Cornwall? I mean, in, in excuse me, when you were in Trinidad? No, because I've been there many times, because I used to use it as a stopping off place when I was going down to Brazil, where I had a house. So, uh, oh, you're good. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think we'll take we'll take uh, a vote. Firstly, well, let's let's the uh, audience uh, say um, Potola. Well, no, Eugenia, I won't tell you what the audience says. What is your view on that statement? Um, I think that he is that that he was very adroit at making things up, but uh, I don't. I think this one's a lie. We'll put you down as light. The audience have a seventy percent a lie, thirty percent uh, true. <laughs> Potola, reveal to us. Were you ever an extra on the film Raiders of the Lost Ark? It's a lie. <laughs> so, audience <laughs> and Thanks, Eugenie. I was trying to think, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where the hell was that supposed to have taken place? <laughs> was, it in, was that the one? In, I can't remember. As soon as was you started talking about Trinidad, I knew you were... You're really yeah. going to struggle I from then on. Do I go? Do I go with Egypt? Do I, do I go with the jungle? And there was one that was in the jungle. There was one I think that was in North Africa, and I thought I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm. I can't wait until I see what uh, DPR gives me. <laughs> um, let me just uh, create a new poll before I uh, tell you. Uh, proceed. Um, I'm just going to put. Uh, you, you, you get the. Obviously, the, the audience is very intelligent. They understand. So I'm just going to put um, uh, lying or, well, is it a lie or is it true? Um, so put lie or true. And then I will send you your uh, first statement. Um, 
Okay. And you should see that appearing in the chat any moment now. Okay. I have a relative who is an, who is an Elvis impersonator. Put hold on. Okay. Okay. Who's the relative? Uh, what, what is it? uh, it's my brother. <laughs> your, um, your face is frozen, by the way, Eugenie, so I can't I'm tell. I'm sorry. Can't oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, if you turn your camera off and then back on, it should bring oh, it back into life. I think this is a shabby trick to try and hide your body language and no, technical no, difficulties. This, this is true. I can, I'm just going just gonna to tell you the truth. Um, the, the Elvis impersonator is my brother. Right. And uh, older or younger? Older. And where did he do his uh, Elvis impersonating? Uh, in Las Vegas. That's where all the that's where all the real you know Vegas uh, that that's where all the the really good Elvis impersonators go because there's a huge yeah. market you know Elvis used to be in uh, perform in Las Vegas a lot so there's a lot of a lot of need for Elvis impersonation in Las Vegas at weddings and so forth and so on. If you're interrupting, but uh, what's the name of the location in Las Vegas where he does this? Oh, several locations. There's a lot yeah. of different. Um, there's a lot of different marriage chapels in Las Vegas, and people will sometimes ask for an Elvis impersonator at a uh, a marriage chapel. And does he advertise this? How does he advertise? He used to have a website, but he's retired now. Oh, so he no longer is a, an Elvis impersonator. Well, you know, since I'm in my late 60s and he's older than I am, he's, he's a little long in the tooth to be... Uh, no way, person. Eugenie. That's a lie what? in itself. You're not. <laughs> you, you know, you've got to do a lot of dancing around to be an Elvis impersonator. And, you know, I mean, my, my, my brother's pretty fit, but uh, he, just, he just felt, you know, he just felt that nobody really wants to come and, and watch an, uh, an, an aging, gray-haired Elvis. So, so he, he hung up his spangled suit a few years ago. So why do you say that he is an Elvis impersonator? Why didn't you say he was an Elvis impersonator? Oh, did I say he is? I'm sorry, I should have, yes, said, I, I should have said he was an Elvis impersonator. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so when he was an Elvis impersonator, uh, how did he get started in this? Uh, what started him off? Well, you know, all of us uh, Scots are pretty good singers. Uh, all well, I shouldn't say all of us. I'm, I, I actually am probably the least good singer of the lot of it. But my two older sisters and my brother, they sang in the school choir and all that. And and uh, he's really got a, quite a good voice, and uh, he's also a very good mimic. And I, I, I don't know exactly how he he started, uh, but um, I could. You know, easily imagine somebody saying, uh, "Hey, you do a pretty good Elvis. You ought to get a you know, ought to get a suit and um, and uh, 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 you know, see if you can get some gigs." And how old was he when this happened? He was probably in his forties. So, so he didn't. So your brother suddenly became an Elvis impersonator in his forties, and you didn't think to ask him how on earth did you get into that? Uh, well, you know, I mean, like I say, he's got a really good voice, and he's always been a really good mimic, and uh, so it all sort of fits. It all sort of fits, don't you think? I mean, yeah. So that didn't that, surprise you. Well, one last question, Pot, and then um, there's a few announcements I want to make quickly. Make one last question, Pot, and then we'll. Uh, yep. Uh, for me, you mean? I thought you wanted to ask the question. I know. Oh, yeah, okay. from you. All right. Um, so he, yeah, he was doing this since his forties, um, and and. Um, Oh, I can't think of another question because I think I've made up my mind on this one. So All no, right. I'm, well, I'm pause happy that because I, I have to say that it's uh, abundantly clear that at the moment we're being featured. If you would like to come and join um, 24 Hours uh, charity show in support of Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, please don't stay out on the outside. Come and join us. We're having a fun game between the outstanding Eugenie Scott and the awesome uh, Pothole of 54. <laughs> it's also clear to me that the number of people in the room compared to the, those that are actually uh, voting in the poll, indicates that probably a lot of people don't know where the poll is. If you look under the right-hand side, where you've got the list of people's names, then you've got a, a, a row of five icons, and underneath that, another row of five icons. Underneath that, you've got one on its own, 
so it's four on the second row, one on its own on the right hand side, it's got a few little um, vertical lines. That is where you vote in the poll and I'm going to take that poll now on the question of whether Eugenie has a relative who is a Elvis impersonator. I'm going to ask you though, Pot, first, what do you think? Is it true or is it a lie? Well, can I just analyze my thought processes? Because Please. Uh, the first thing, technically it's a lie because uh, Eugenie says he was an Elvis impersonator. She suddenly changed her story. That may have been uh, my dyslexia though. Might have been, and that, that was something I thought. That, that's a kind of a human a slip which actually suggests that perhaps it's true. What really um, made me rather suspicious though was the fact that, um, that he would become an Elvis impersonator and she wouldn't think to say, what? How the hell did you get into that? I think that would be my first question if my sister suddenly announced that she was an Elvis impersonator. I also was rather put off by the very long and complicated answers to rather simple questions. So I would say that that's <laughs> right. So you're going to say it's a lie. Eugenie is lying. And the audience, I have to say, I'll refresh it again, but uh, the audience likewise are 80% roughly you are lying, Eugenie. Will you reveal whether you have a relative who is an Elvis impersonator? Would I lie to you? My brother, Alan Keith Scott, was an Elvis impersonator <laughs> in Las Vegas for many, many years. Practically everything I told you was true. <laughs> including including my, my not being curious about why he was, because he's my brother. <laughs> So he said, I'm an Elvis impersonator, and you said, oh, okay. <laughs> You've got a good voice, that, that makes sense. <laughs> very good, very good, Eugenie. <laughs> Paul, you're, you're, you're one down. Uh, the audience I'm one has down. everything wrong at the moment. Let me find another uh, Paolo statement. Um, oh, yes, we'll try this one. Uh, And I have to say, as I'm typing this, it really makes me giggle. I was looking back at some of the emails that uh, had been exchanged between Eugenie and myself and leading up to this. And uh, she did say uh, in one of her emails, but DPR, no one's going to believe that goody two-shoes like me could ever lie. <laughs> uh, sorry. Maybe by the end of this program, maybe by the end of this program, uh, evolution will have taken place. Uh, I've got to spell this correctly. And I hear you've been practicing on your husband. But I should have been practicing this on my wife, but um, she thinks I've been lying to her for years, so she thinks I'm pretty good. <laughs> okay, Pothola, I've sent you one. Uh, right. And I, as you read that out, I will set up a new poll. Um, uh, okay. New. Um, right. I, I once touched the bottom of the current president of Venezuela. Hugo Chavez. Right. Okay. What were you? Why were you in Venezuela? Oh, excuse me. The uh, first question I will ask is, where did this, where did this touching take place? Um, it was in uh, Tokyo, um, because he was visiting Tokyo at the time. Non uh, sorry, I, I called you non -strum. I'm sorry, Paula. Um, someone said that they didn't hear it. Could you read it out again? Oh, okay, I'll read it out again. I once touched the bottom, the ass, I suppose, or the ass of the current president of Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, and uh, it happened in Tokyo. I, I was a correspondent based in Tokyo at the time. How long were you in Tokyo? Uh, well, I was based there for about 16 years, from the late 80s to the and why was Hugo Chavez in Tokyo? Uh, he was just visiting because, you know, heads of state come over and uh, he was just a head of state visiting for um, you know, a state visit, that's it. Hmm, he wasn't a head of state when you were over there, so that is, you're going to have to work a little harder than that. On no, this I, one. I think there are much more obvious <laughs> questions, Eugenie, like not whether oh, he's so a head of state or not, but <laughs> what was Potholder doing? For, I don't know, it's, a, it's your, your cross-examination. Um, I was working up to that. I apologize. I was cutting to the chase. 
Uh, he'd just become president of Venezuela. Uh, that was in his early years. I see. Okay. Uh, what what was the what was the situation in which you and Hugo were in the same room? Uh, we were having our photograph taken together, and um, um, they, you know, uh, wanted a picture of us. And you know, I'd, I'd been in Venezuela, so Venezuelan style, you put your arm around someone, and I just happened uh, instead of putting my arm around his back, I accidentally had my hand touching his ass. How did he react? Uh, he didn't say or do anything. Uh, I, don't, I still don't know if he noticed, but um, I mean, I didn't want to move my hand. I suppose he must have done. <laughs> but, you know, when you're having a picture taken, or when you do something uncomfortable, you don't want to draw attention to it. So I, you know, it was just there and I kept it there until all the photographs had been finished and, and that was it. And then we shook hands at the end of it. Hmm. I can't help from the audience, Eugenie, because um, someone appears to be trying to uh, Google the answer. I'm not sure you're going to find the answer on Google. Um, <laughs> well, you could Google it. The... It wouldn't have made Google. <laughs> it wouldn't have made Google, no. <laughs> but you could Google when Peter was actually in Tokyo. I mean, that would be one. Uh, and, and it seems to me that Chavez hasn't been the president of Venezuela quite that long. So, so that sounds pretty suspicious in terms of my thinking about uh, whether, whether Potholer is, is being straight with us or not. Um, okay, so... 2001, uh, the end of, right at the end of 2001 was when I left Tokyo. Hmm. Hmm. I have to think about that one then. All right. Uh, was, was anyone else in the room other than the you and, and, Sorry, Hugo and the muted. photographer? Yes, um, it, it was, uh, there'd been a, a lunch for him. And so, yeah, there were lots of people. It was at the end of the lunch. And uh, so there were lots of people around. Um, yeah, so there were quite a few people. Not that everyone one would have seen me touch his ass, but they would have seen us <laughs> together, yeah. What was uh, Eugenie, what, I'm going to have to insist, one more question, but I'm going to have to insist that you uh, give us an answer because we've got a few more to go through and right. we're two-thirds uh, okay. of the program. You know, I think, this, this is kind of hard because uh, Peter's very good. I mean, he's, he's just has, he's presenting all of this stuff with this completely straight face. <laughs> Cool. On the other hand, he's, he's seen this program before, <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest that this is this is not true. I think this is a lie. And you would be in agreement with fifty-three percent. That's mm. how close oh, it is. Divide. Fifty-three percent think that you are lying, Potola. Tell Good. us, well, I, did you I touch say... the ass of the current president of Venezuela? I have made up some cards. I can now do it in style of the program and hold up the card to show you. It is true. <laughs> Good gracious. <laughs> is, that, is that back to front? I don't know. I'm seeing this back to front. That's correct. It's a true story. It's a true story. I, I, just to, to explain why this happened, I, I was um, a director of the Foreign Correspondents <laughs> Club. and Before I knew what had happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it was my turn to host a lunch because we used to host luncheons for visiting dignitaries who came and spoke at the club. So I was hosting this lunch for President Chavez. So I sat next to him throughout dinner and um, through the lunch and uh, we chatted. And at the end of it, AP wanted a picture. So we put our arms around each other and he was a lot taller than I thought he was. He's quite a short guy, but I, I didn't realize I, I, you know, he was a bit taller than I thought. So my hand accidentally landed on his bum. And uh, I, as I said to you, I couldn't take it away because I thought that is just going to draw attention to where it is. So I kept it there, and and I can now. I'm probably one of the few people in the world that's actually touched his ass, uh, the male variety, anyway. And uh, he has very firm buttocks, by the way, Richard. In case anyone was interested. Um, more information. I don't than think necessary. anyone was. <laughs> We will move uh, straight on as I introduce the new poll. Uh, so we've basically got Eugenie's um, convince everyone once, um, and um, so has Pot. But Eugenie's got another attempt to see if she can. 
convince you or not. Um, this one's coming through for you, Eugenie, as I introduce uh, or set up a new poll. Mm -hmm. I still get nervous before public speeches, so I always dance a jig before going on stage. Okay, I, I hope this is your appalling ty typing here, Richard. I've got a gig before going on stage. Um, I'm dyslexic. He, 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 <laughs> means, he means jig. It's a jig. Is it an Irish it, it, jig? Actually, it's a. It's not an Irish jig exactly. It's more like a uh, an Appalachian um, an Appalachian uh, clog dance. Uh, oh yes, I, I know I, what I, that is. <laughs> Well, no, it, it's actually a, a very a very a very subtle kind of thing. You you don't you don't want people to see you doing this, you know, because it looks. It, I've been doing this for a hundred years, right? So everybody assumes that I know what I'm doing, and uh, but. You know, you still get. You, you want to do a good job, and and you, you're ready to go on stage, and and so there's this little shuffle, stomp, 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 shuffle, stomp, stomp, stomp that I do before I go on, which I learned when I was teaching um, uh, at the University of Kentucky. I did a, a study out in in Appalachia, and, and I learned how to I learned how to clog, which is a, a particular type of kind of stamping, kind of like the the Irish. But it's, it's really an American um, uh, kind of dance. But, but you can do, do you it without do really this? moving your feet much. Usually in the wings, oh. but, but if I right. have to, but if I get out on stage and I'm still getting the butterflies, I can do it very subtly behind the podium before, you know, and nobody can see. I see. But it, it sounds like if it's a foot stomping dance that uh, people would notice. The, how, how do you do a foot stomping dance quietly? Well, it's not. It's not really. You, you don't have to do it stampingly. Um, uh, the clog step is basically a. You know, if you, you, this is hard to do on the radio, so to speak. But it's it's a shuffle. It's all right. Tap, We're not tap, on the tap. radio. Uh, we have we have video. If you would like to show us. <laughs> That's right. I'll spare you the embarrassment. <laughs> but it's it's a it, it it's it's a shuffling, and then uh, so you you. You, you shuffle one foot and then it's so shuffle right, tap left, tap right, tap left, shuffle left, tap right, tap left, then you're back on your right foot again. And you only really need to do one one series and you can do it really subtly and I've gotten very good at this so that it doesn't even look like I'm swaying. I mean it's 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 taken a little bit of practice, but I find that if I can just do some physical before I do something mental, it, it kind of helps to calm me down. Now, did you do it before you came on this show? You know, I, I, I probably should have because, uh, but, but, but I, this isn't a formal speech, you know, th this is more just kind of an informal uh, chat. So, uh, so no, I didn't. Uh, it may just to ever... show how relaxed I am, the DPR. <laughs> Has ever, anyone ever caught you doing this dance? You say you don't like people to see you doing it. Has someone caught you doing it? And what happened? Yeah, when I when I would when I first started uh, doing this, and and it was really only about 15 years ago. I was in the. Um, <laughs> this, this is a little bit embarrassing, actually, but I was in the wings, and uh, it was it was really a very large auditorium of you know probably you know 1,500 people. And I was in the wings, and my host was getting ready to introduce me, and I did this little kind of shuffle, shuffle, and he looked over and he said, Dr. Scott, do you have to go to the bathroom? <laughs> I said, oh, oh, this is embarrassing. And I said, no, no, I was, this, is just a, this is just a little kind of ritual that I do that kind of, and at, at that point I thought, yeah, you got to come up with something else, but this is the one that really seems to work. <laughs> so that's right. okay. Okay, I I think I'm ready on this one, Richard. Okay, uh, let's go for it. Let me let me before you do that invite people to vote uh, who are watching. Uh, let me re just refresh the poll and see. Um, oh, this is interesting. This is very interesting. Oh, okay, don't tell um, me. I'll, I'll I'm not. My... I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. What do right. you think, Pothola? Um, I've no doubt from the way Eugenie describes it, there is such a thing as the Appalachian clog dance. Uh, well, I don't have Google handy, so I can't tell. But you do make it sound very convincing, Eugenie, that the dance exists. The question is, do you actually do this dance before you uh, go on stage? Um, 
there are a number of things, rituals that people have before they go into public speaking. And some are rituals, some sort of superstitious, others, as you say, to release attention. This is certainly a plausible one. And I think from the way you're describing it, you describe it reasonably well. I'm going to go that this is true. So you are saying true. The audience is saying true. Eugenie, can you reveal whether before you go on stage to calm your nerves, you dance a jig? Would I lie to you? Yes. <laughs> it what? A, it's false. It's it false. It is false. <laughs> and for, I am not doing well. <laughs> for goody two shoes, she is whipping your ass, Paola. <laughs> Now, she certainly is. This Appalachian uh, clog dance, though, is a real one, is it? Oh, yes, absolutely. And I do know yeah, how to do it. There was, there was lots of true things that I told you. Just not that I actually do it. That was the false part. <laughs> now, that was very good. You I do think, know that na I next time you business. appear in front of an audience, no one's going to believe a word you say. When you say <laughs> creationism has no validity, they're going to say, yeah, she, she's just a lie. She probably did a jig before she came on stage. <laughs> Um, I may have to start. <laughs> I'm acutely aware that we have um, concordance coming up next. Uh, concordance, bear with us. We might overrun by a few moments, but we will get to you. Uh, there are quite a few more that we've got to go through. Um, let's see if we can get a couple more each from both of you. Um, this one is for Pothola. I'm sorry. Oh, old age is a terrible thing. Where's my glasses? Um, oh, yes. So we'll go for, I think, this one. And neither of you should read anything into any spelling mistakes because I am <laughs> dyslexic and also blind. So um, there we go. And we'll start a new poll. Which okay. I need a different pair of glasses. Okay, Potholder, over to you. I was baptized into a voodoo religion. Could you just repeat that because your audio... I was baptized, baptized into a voodoo religion. Where did this baptism take place? Uh, this was in Brazil. Uh, as I said before, I, I used to live out there. And uh, were, was this a, an individual activity or were there, uh, was it a group baptism? No, no, it was just me. Just you and the practitioner? Uh, yeah, well, um, yes, there was me and my girlfriend uh, my Brazilian girlfriend and the, uh, the the local priest of the, the the voodoo religion who performed the ceremony. And what what version of um, voodoo were you baptized into? Uh, it was <coughs> um, a religion. You mean the name of the religion? Uh, the name of yeah, because yeah, yeah. Uh, it was called Candomblé. Hmm. Which you must have heard of. Because it's a, uh, it's a uh, you presumably in your work as a cultural anthropologist or a physical anthropologist, you've come across this. No, uh. <laughs> but it's plausible. It's plausible. Um, so let's see. Uh, uh, Could I throw in what, 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 was, what, what, yes. what does the actual what did the process of being baptized involve? That's what I was going to ask. Next. I'm terribly but... sorry. You're a step ahead of me as usual. I'll just shut the fuck up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Quite all right. And in in this baptismal ceremony, um, what what was done? What, um, what did the priest do to you? Okay. Um, the main part of the ceremony was that um, they poured water over my head. Actually, it wasn't wasn't just water. It was um, I think it, it was a kind of a colored water, I think it was tea or something like that, and it poured that over my, or, or the chi rather, poured it over my head. This was the, the priestess who did this. Um, and she sort of incanted something. It wasn't anything I could understand because it wasn't in Portuguese, so I didn't know what she was saying. But uh, I could recognize a few words like um, a River Jordan, for example. She evoked the name of the River Jordan. and. And, and I had to wear a necklace, a special bead necklace. Um, that was basically it. Oh, and afterwards, um, yeah, I had to, there were three instructions that I had to wear the necklace 
for the next three days. I had to refrain from sexual intercourse and I had to refrain from eating fish. So I managed two of those. I mean, I, can, I, couldn't, go three, <laughs> I couldn't go three days without fish, so I... I <laughs> This is critically important. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this minor detail. So, yeah. so, why why did you why why did you become uh, initiated into this religion? Uh, my girlfriend at the time, uh, her father was very much involved with uh, this religion, and um, so I got quite interested. Not not because I was religious, but because I was just interested in learning everything I could about, um, you know, that uh, part of Brazil. I was learning about Brazilian history and, and so on. And this was an aspect of Brazil I was very interested in. So um, when, you know, I, I said to her, do you think your father could introduce me? And um, that was my idea. I said, well, could I get baptized? So just to join the uh, church, as it were. And where did this take place? Uh, this was in a place called Salvador, Salvador da Bahia, in the northeast of Brazil. And is that a, uh, uh, what, what size community is that? It's quite a big city. It's uh, about a million, million people. That's, that's, where, that's where I live. Eugenie, I'm going to insist on an answer. Right. Uh, let me just right. uh, check the poll um, as you give us your answer. Was, okay. in your view, uh, Potholer baptized uh, into some fish rejecting Hindu. <laughs> only Thanks. temporarily fish rejecting you know there's enough that was plausible about that um, voodoo tends to be an urban kind of thing and uh, he's living in a big city um, so that 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 rang true it's also the case that um, with with voodoo, there are behavioral restrictions that are placed upon the initiate in initiates. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say that this is true. Right. Do you want me to reveal all, Richard? Oh, do you, uh, what's what the, what's does the, the audience fault? say? I'm totally sorry. I was muted. Um, oh, yeah. quite all right. Uh, uh, the audience has said it is a lie. Eugenia has said it is true. Potholder, would you reveal whether you deprived yourself of fish for three days to be baptized into a Vindu cult? I have to say the that Eugenie has outsmarted the audience. It is true. <laughs> Absolutely true. Eugenie, you are too good at this. She is too good at this. Um, amazing. <laughs> I'm kind of guessing that concordance is in the room. Concordance, um, if we could just have a couple more, um, if, if you don't mind if we trespass into your hour, um, that would be great fun. Because um, let's face it, this is, this is the thing. I thought this was either going to be a fantastic hour or it was going to fall flat on its face. And I think, I don't know, what do you reckon? I think this is a huge I'm amount of fun. fun. This I'm having good. I, I'm being, I'm being absolutely slaughtered. You I'm are completely <laughs> slaughtered. I can't remember. I can't Please figure out how I did the scores, but you haven't. Well, you've won half a point, I think, on my scoring. Uh, Eugenie, Please. let's 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 nobody, move rapidly on. So I did one. More surprised than I am. All right, <laughs> right, goody, right. Goody two shoes. Huh. No one's <laughs> no one's going to believe that anymore. Okay, I will set up a new poll as I. Um, sorry. Oh yeah. Okay, this one's for Eugenie. Spelling mistake. Just one second. Oh, that's all right, Richard. I won't catch up on it. <laughs> makes more makes it more fun that way, anyway. <laughs> okay, there we go. That one's for Eugenie. As I set up the new poll. In order to keep my legs in trim, I often walk up the stairs sideways or even backwards. Well, my first question is going to be one right up in your field. <laughs> 
if, <laughs> if, if we were meant to walk sideways or backwards upstairs, why is there no evolutionary process that allowed us to go through that? What, why does that keep your legs in trim more than walking normally, let me ask? Well, number, number one, we did not evolve to walk upstairs. Stairs are a very modern kind of invention, so your evolutionary explanation isn't going to, isn't going to take you very far, in my opinion. But I'll actually, follow up on that in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> all right, that's fine. Actually, walking sideways is a very good way of exercising the muscles that extend the leg um, uh, and obviously the the muscles that move the leg laterally, which tend to not be exercised very much in just normal walking or treadmill kind of work. Now, what you have to do is you have to, uh, you know, you, you can't just, <laughs> the old story about the, the, the uh, cow on the hillside with one longer leg than the other. I mean, you have to sort of shift and have your right leg going up uh, part of the way and then turn and have your left leg going up part of the way. Going up sideways is a lot easier than going up backwards, but going up backwards is really great because it really gets the hamstrings and the and the gastrox. So it's it's a you know you ought to try it sometime. It's really good exercise. Yeah, no. I, when I was talking about our, our uh, evolutionary um, path, I was thinking more in the sense that if you if you followed uh, the, the evolutionary history of walking, it would be walking in a straight line or walking up a hill not necessarily doing anything on the stairs, whether that's backwards, forwards, or anything else. So it's interesting that you choose to do that. Uh, do, you, do you also do, um, do you also walk uh, a lot? I mean, normally, like walking long distances? Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you, it, it sort of depends on where I am. If I'm at home, uh, the tendency is that I'll just you know, I'll, I'll try to do some errands. I'll try to walk. Um, old ladies get osteoporotic, and so, you know, weight-bearing exercise is really important. I travel a lot, and one of the things that I find is that hotels have stairs. They don't always have exercise rooms. And so I find that I can just sort of duck down the hallway, so to speak, and go up and down a couple of flights of stairs, and pretty soon my heart rate's up, my breathing gets up. Uh, and it also is a, a very good way of, of um, exercising some leg muscles that don't ordinarily get as much, uh, as much work. But what would you given need to, to Eugene? One, one more question, for her, <laughs> yeah. and then we're going to have to take yeah. a decision on it. Oh, he's okay, really yeah. rushing us along here, isn't he? He is, isn't he? <laughs> we, we've so taken much. up the hour, and I don't want to. Uh, I want to do one more each, but it's going to have to be quick fire. But um, I don't want. To, I don't want to trespass too much into concordance's All right, generosity. Be the last question. You, you're not an athlete. Uh, we can all get on perfectly well without doing the same thing. Why do you specifically need to do this? when the rest of the human race seems to get on perfectly well without doing it. Well, the rest of the human race can, can do it just fine, but you know what, what I said in the statement was in order to keep my legs in trim. Um, the older you get, the more work you have to do to keep your muscle tone up, and um, I just, you know, maybe it's a vanity thing, but uh, I'd sort of like to keep my legs for as long as I can, so stressing in the, them in this way to kind of exercise different muscles is, is a good opportunity to, um, to uh, try to keep, keep, keep working it as long as I can. <laughs> well, right. Let's take a decision. Okay. You want to have the audience one or just me go for it? You go for it. I'll tell you what the audience says. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. It's that way around, isn't it? Listen, uh, you just lie so well. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All I, can, all I can say is it just seems like a bizarre kind of workout, especially for someone who understands the physiology of the human body so well and the fact that this is not a necessary um, exercise for people to undertake. I'm going to have to go with false. And so have the audience. Uh, Eugenie, do you walk up the stairs sideways? Nope. Never done it in my life. <laughs> <laughs> you got Not one. Like for her. I have to say that this actually I, a confession to make. I invented that because I do. I thought that had to be the case. <laughs> oh, of course you did. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. Okay, we're up to the hour. I'm gonna we're gonna have uh, two quick fire ones, very few questions, and then we're going to come to Concordance, who I know has done some preparation for. I don't want to uh, trespass too much uh, into his hour, but as I say. I'm having so much fun. Um, so am I. Uh, right. So is it Potholder next? It's my turn. 
Um, what, have I, what have I got written down? Oh, yes. Um, Okay, Pot, there you go. I'll start a new, uh, new poll for us. Um, uh, I was once a girl guide and even got a badge for needlework. Okay, why were you a girl guide? Because That's not lived... typical. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. Uh, in fact, when I was a, a child, actually these days it's much more common. You can get girls joining Boy Scouts and boys joining the guides and so on. Um, but when, when I did this, um, I, my sisters were in the guides and I wanted to join the scouts. Um, well, actually the cubs, because I was too young to join the scouts, but they didn't have a local cub troop. They did have girl guides in the village where we lived, which is in Hampshire. Um, and so my mother said, well, why don't you join your sisters? And I was pretty young. I was only about, I guess, five or six or something. And you don't, you know, at that age, you don't tend to hang out with girls at school, but I saw the kinds of things they were doing and I kind of liked it. And um, so, yeah, I wanted to uh, to be a part of it, so I joined. I didn't join. So what, what kind of things did they did they do besides needlework? Um, actually, they did a lot of the kind of things that cubs would have done. So I w that was one of the reasons I was attracted to it, like building fires, um, making things out of um, grass weaving, you know, making things out of... Uh, elements from the forest and they used to go in the forest uh, collecting leaves collecting berries and there was you know all that kind of thing and I was I was actually at that time very much into collecting things and um, so to me it, it wasn't something that oh it's a girls thing it was just something that I enjoyed doing and how long were you a girl guide to be honest I can't remember I was so young I mean even now my memory of it is not that strong because it was so long ago but I think it would have been about a couple of years maybe um, it was while while we were in that particular village and we did move away from there later so then we were no none of us was was in the girl guide troop then but it was about a couple of years I guess so sing me a song that you learned in the girl guides I cannot remember <laughs> as sorry. I say it's got to be a quick fire round we've got to move on all right Eugenie, Do yes not. or no? Was he in the guides? Let me have a look at the uh, poll. Uh, well, you know, it's it's possible because there are boys who uh, are in Girl Scouts or Girl Guides because their mother is a leader or because their siblings are something. But it's much. It, it's not very common. And this, the the business bud going out and collecting berries and making stuff out of them that doesn't ring true. So I'll say it's a lie. I have to say that I liked collecting things. But that was, that was a good save. Uh, the was... audience say uh, by a majority of 51% to 48.9%, sorry, 49%, that you were lying. You almost got away with it, Paulo, but I think you've got a confession to make. You're, you're emasculating me. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> Again, I have to say that is actually based on a true story uh, from me because. Yeah. When I was around the age of four or five, my mother got involved in the girl guide, um, or brownies it was at the time. She was tawny, no, she was brown owl or tawny owl, I can't remember. But because uh, she got involved because my sister was involved, um, she couldn't let me go home on my own. So she had to take me to the brownies. So I was actually kind of a brownie for a couple of years. So there we go. Eugenie, I'm going to do one last one for you, and then, according to we will be coming to you. Um, it wasn't a yours. fair fight, though, Peter. I used to be a Girl Scout leader, so it wasn't a fair I, fight. I, I, I was, I I was no wondering idea. why you didn't ask him what they call the head of a Girl Guide troop. Well, because I'm not sure he what it's called in contract. Great Britain. All right, um, let's see if we can get this one up very quickly for... Eugenie, this will be our last one, um, but I hope you have all enjoyed it. I knew I missed it. Didn't I? I can't wait. <laughs> mm. 
carry on typing like this, you could be waiting for some time. Richard's never heard of copy and paste, you see, Eugenie. <laughs> There's a good reason I didn't do that, Pop. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I can't go into it now. All right, fair enough. You're exactly that may right. be a lie, though, but we're not <laughs> testing it. Okay, I'll set up a new poll. Uh, Eugene, that one's for you. After winning an art competition when I was a child, I seriously considered becoming a professional artist. This is a tough one, because this is, this is one that could easily be true or false either way. Um, Okay. Can I give you a clue because it is a quick fire round? There is a yeah. reason that I said to uh, Eugenie that she must have a pen and a piece of paper to hand. Perhaps you'd like to take it from there. Yes. Yeah, well, that was going to be one of the things I was going to ask her. First of all, let me ask, she's doing it already. Um, what was the art competition you, you won? It was an art competition of, of uh, in third grade, and it involved drawing animals and at the time I was really quite horse crazy and so the only thing I knew how to draw actually was horses and so I drew a horse and uh, I guess it was better than all the other third grade horses although quite frankly uh, um, it wasn't a very good horse <laughs> and, and when you thought about becoming an artist how far did you go with that did, did you take up an art class or what happened no, um, the, the good news is that when I was a grade school student uh, in Minneapolis, it was a, it was a, of course it was a long time ago and education was better funded than, than it is now in the United States and so we actually did have art classes as part of the uh, school curriculum. So I didn't have to take, you know, additional uh, courses. But uh, at the time, I was thinking that I was really going to be, uh, um, you know, really going to pursue this uh, 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 as something that I was very serious about. But you know, it's a funny thing, um, and, and I guess this is sort of, sort of a, a lesson to us all how easy it is to sort of squelch a, a, a child's um, ambition. Uh, one of the other students commented to me, you don't draw horses nearly as well as so-and-so, and that just so you know broke my spirit so to speak that I that I just stopped trying anymore it was true he his uh, his father was the uh, the local newspaper cartoonist and uh, he actually was had had very good genes for drawing and he, and he was quite a good artist for a third grader and um, I never quite could measure up and I uh, but you know Pot Hollow, when are you going to ask? It's a quick fire round. When are you going to ask I, the one question? Okay, I, I just want you to do. Richard, stay still. I want you. Don't draw a horse because that's too easy for you. Draw, draw a picture of Richard for me. You got draw a picture of Richard. Yep. All uh, right. Well, Richard has sort of a a longish face. Um, <laughs> he has. Uh, 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 a little on the a little little bit. Of, it's a pretty good oval, actually. I've never never really looked at you yes, closely, it, much, but you know. He's it, a handsome. He's a handsome fellow. There's it, no doubt. He's. Well, I'm I'm drawing I'm drawing yeah I'm drawing uh, Richard right not not you. Okay. <laughs> you also oh, are a very a very <laughs> handsome fellow, but um, but I told you the only thing I really know how to draw is is horses, but so there you go. I don't know That's if you can. That's why I asked you to draw. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So this is why I didn't now, continue so, beyond third grade. So you haven't really progressed very much since third grade. <laughs> I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. My mother actually was a pretty good artist, but uh, I didn't pursue it. Sorry to say. I, well, I don't we want to, to, to. We have to move on. We have to move on to the corners. We've overrun by ten minutes. Go on, quick. I'm sure ten. She was fantastic. I think though that this is a lie. I have to say the audience was very, very much in favor of it being true until they saw the drawing and then it just shifted. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's bizarrely though, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna refresh again. It is now fifty fifty. So half the audience oh. no or not. Eugenie Scott, did you have aspirations to be an artist? Nope. Very good. 
Uh, well, actually, uh, actually, I hate to say this because I did have aspirations to be an artist, but I never won an art competition. So mm -hmm. all that part about being told that I was not as good at drawing horses as so and so—that was all true. I didn't do yeah, research well enough, did I? I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize I was going to cause you trauma. But, but, but you get a point. You get a point for that. <laughs> Can I thank you both very much? We've overrun by 12 minutes, and I know that Concordance has spent a lot of time on the next hour, so I don't want to go any further. I know, um, Eugenia, you wanted to speak um, about MSF, as did uh, Pothola. Can I ask, um, firstly, Eugenie, then Pothola, give us the last words, and whilst they're doing that, can I ask for a huge thumbs up from the audience for two people who have been great sports for this? Eugenie first, then uh, Pothola. Please, everybody listening to this, um, Doctors Without Borders is a wonderful organization. Please donate and support them. They do extremely important work all around the world uh, and generally speaking on their own nickels, so to speak. But obviously money needs to be provided for supplies and travel and everything else. Please support this very good organization. And DPR, thanks very much for uh, putting this together. And I hope you can survive the next 12 hours. I'm sure I will. Uh, thank you for being a great sport, Eugenie. You always are. You're fantastic. And the words of Richard Dawkins are not too far off the mark, except where he says differences. Leave that aside. <laughs> Pothola, I know you wanted to say something as well. Yes, indeed. I, I often get asked to endorse things, and, and I rarely do because I, I hate disappointing people. So I usually say no to everything. I had no hesitation, though, in, in uh, accepting BPR's invitation to do this. Um, he's worked very hard on this. And uh, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières is a, an organization very close to my heart because I've had a lot of personal involvement with them. When I used to cover some of the wars in Southeast Asia, uh, mm. I, they were some of my best contacts. And I, I was with them. I saw the work they were doing. I was watching the operations and everything that they were doing. These guys risk their lives and they come from countries where they can earn good salaries, where they have comfortable lives, and they put themselves on the front line in danger to help other people, and they do it impartially. And really, this is an organization that needs your help. And I would finish on this note. We have discovered quite clearly on the evidence presented to us this evening that you must trust the journalists because they don't. <laughs> it's the scientists that lie. So next time you're watching Fox News and Bill O'Reilly, <laughs> on that bombshell, Tony, you the show. Thank you very much. What for can I say? Thank you for everyone that's watched. <laughs> Thanks,